It is good to see all of you, and uh, I appreciate your prayers. Last week, I was feeling better by midday last week, um, and uh, just, I think, traveling all over the country in a way, I, I can't bounce back like I used to. And uh, I used to be able to drive more than two hours without my feet looking like Fred Flintstone. Now all of a sudden I feel like I need to find some of Annie's pregnancy stuff because my ankles look like hers used to when she was having kids. Um, today is our last day, uh, not our last day ever, just the last day of the series. <laughs> um, the, uh, we've been in a series called Breath. Uh, we begin our summer series next week. I would encourage you, you saw the promo for that, you know, Heaven on Earth. And we'll be working through that over the summer. And uh, I'm excited about what that uh, is going to be for us as well. But today we are completing our series, sort of our Pentecost series. is sort of either side of Pentecost Sunday. And uh, looking at the idea of breath. Breath is a type and picture type of the Holy Spirit. We've seen that and we've talked about that over the last couple of weeks. Today... I'm going to, we'll start right from the beginning. Your verse that you can memorize, and I hope you will choose to memorize. This is a great verse to memorize. I think it will be a great encouragement to you. It's from Romans 8 and 11. Let's jump right in. It says this. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. Can I tell you, if that's all you memorize, will you just memorize that? The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. I, I just for the next few minutes today, I want to talk to you about the same spirit. It's the same spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I'm going to say it a thousand times today until you get it. I hope that you can't even eat lunch today without hearing that. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. 2,000 years ago, somewhere outside the walls of Jerusalem, just before dawn, the spirit of God crept into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and raised to life the body of Jesus Christ. We've been celebrating that for the last several weeks. And, but what we're celebrating right now is that 50 days later, that same spirit came to the disciples along with 100 plus others that were gathered in an upper room and he baptized them in that spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then Peter went on to preach with boldness. Not the same put your foot in your mouth boldness he had had for the last year, few years before, but with a boldness that was beyond him. And 3,000 came to know the Lord that day. That same spirit is a creator. He created life as he breathed into Adam. He created life as he incarnated Christ in Mary. He created and birthed the ecclesia of God, the church, in Acts 2. And he lives in you today. Do we really understand that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you? Pastor Paul, you look awful emotional all of a sudden. Yeah, I, I missed a week, so I've got a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would move on specific people at specific times for specific reasons. And he, we see him throughout all of that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. In the Old Testament, we saw that God was for us. In the Gospels, we saw that Emmanuel had come that God was with us. But as we move into the book of Acts, we see that he is God in us. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. There's no more specific times and places and reasons. He's with us always. He dwells in us. Paul even says when talking about fleeing from, from sexual immorality and those kind of issues, he makes this statement. He says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. 
He dwells in us. You are a new creation today because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You are made alive today because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You can love your enemies. You can bless those who persecute you. You are more than a conqueror today because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I, my prayer today is that somebody here that's hearing my voice, whether you're here, you're hearing it today or this week or whenever, that you will experience resurrection. Yes. That you will experience that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And that he'll fill you with the same power. The verse that Paul writes is right, is in, that we read is in the book of Romans. The Romans. That, that was one church that Paul didn't get to visit until like right at the end. It was a church that started and it was one of the few, most of the books and letters that we see Paul write were the churches that he had planted or did those kind of things. And Rome was different. Rome was a, a church that he had never been to. And Rome was a really unique situation because Rome had, had at some point, we see this in Acts 18, that, that, that one of the, the emperors expelled Jews from Rome. Matter of fact, Priscilla and Aquila that we see in Corinth are in Corinth because they got expelled from Rome. And, and so then the believers that began to be made in Rome were all Gentiles. But then at some point, the Jews began to come back. And so now this congregation in Rome, it, these, these faithful Jewish followers of Jesus come back. And now they're going to church with Gentiles who, who aren't kosher, who aren't circumcised who don't follow the law, who don't do any of the stuff they did. And suddenly there's this sort of conflict. There's these people that don't share the same kind of ideas and values and, and they're, they're coming together. And in the book of Romans, Paul is writing to, to a church that's in crisis, a church in need of reconciliation, a church that's in need of unity, a church that's in need of getting along and sometimes I think we read Romans as a highly theological book, and it is. But I really think, I suspect when you read what Paul's writing and you understand who he's writing to, it's just as much of a sociological book. He was writing to try to get these two very different groups of people and teach them how to live together, how to worship together, how to pray together, how to eat together, how to find their way together. And Paul is telling them, that there is a spirit at work within each one of you. And that spirit has empowered you to live differently. To give you the ability to think differently. He's adopted you into the same family. And through that power of that same spirit. You can live as a reconciled people. Who are reconciling others. And he's saying here's the solution. Here's the solution to you. Finding a common bond. And finding to reconciling to one another. It's not any of the. People's stuff, he says, it's the same spirit living in you that has reconciled you. That's what's going to bring reconciliation. That's what's going to bring unity. I want to look just for a few minutes at, at some of the rest of chapter 8. And, and, and because Paul kind of plants this verse 11 right in the middle, but there's some things before and after it that kind of let us know that he talks about the same spirit. So let's talk about three things, just three things today that that same spirit gives us. The first thing that he gives us is freedom from sin. Paul starts that chapter, and again, he didn't write it in chapters, but in that part of his letter that we see is chapter 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has given us freedom from sin. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. I read a story this week. That there's a, a, a pastor, pastors up in the D.C. area that I know, and, and she, she's a, she's, she's the, the, that church's victor. She's not quite as good, but she's their victor. She's their discipleship pastor. And, and she has this young daughter, and, and I, I follow her on Instagram just to see, catch up, because her daughter Sawyer is the cutest little thing, and she's always posting stuff about where Sawyer. And, uh, and one of my favorite things to, to follow her is 
Sawyer takes a nap somewhere different every day. And so <laughs> she'll have like different posts of where Sawyer's sleeping today. And so you go into her room and she's found a laundry basket in the corner. So, you know, it's kind of, it's really cute. But she told this story about, she was reading this, this sort of Bible storybook to Sawyer. And it was talking about Adam and Eve in the garden and, and kind of explaining how that and Jesus dying on the cross. And she was a little worried. Sawyer too young to kind of grasp this stuff. And she's finishing telling her this whole story, and, and especially on Adam and Eve in the garden. And this is when Sawyer was really little, so her she had that wonderful toddler syntax. And she got she got this, she looked at her, she's kind of, you know, like, well, I hope she got it, I hope that didn't scare her, I hope the snake didn't scare her, you know, you know, kind of that thing as a parent. And she said, Sawyer looked up at her and said, Mommy, why he not kill the snake? <laughs> That was, that was her response to the whole thing. See, we tend to understand the crucifixion, the death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus is about him paying for our sin. And it is. But can I tell you, the crucifixion and death of Jesus was also about killing the snake. It was about triumphing over sin. It was about victory over darkness. It was about overcoming death and obliterating the enemy. I, I, I went back, I was looking, I was thinking about this. I went back to Genesis 3.15 where we find that wonderful prophetic verse where Jesus is, uh, Jesus, where God is actually speaking to, to, in that moment after Adam's sin, and he's kind of addressing each one of them, and he looks at Satan, who was in the form of a snake, and, but he looks at the snake as it was at that moment, and, and he's telling it, you know, you're going to, this is, there's going to be enmity between her offspring, talking about Eve and, and yours, and, and it's sort of that, he's talking about Jesus. Every time he says your offspring, he means there's coming a one that's going to. And he makes this statement in verse 15. He says that, that uh, a lot of translations use the same word. It says, you will, he will bruise your head, but you will bruise his heel. Now, he's using the imagery of a snake because that's the form Satan took in this moment. And, and so there's, there's this image. The image that he's giving, the sort of metaphor as it is, is, is that one will come that will that will bruise the head of the snake as he strikes at his heel. That's the picture. But, the, but he says you'll bruise his head, bruise his heel. But those are two different Hebrew words. The Hebrew word for he'll bruise your heel, talk about Satan will bruise the heel, means that he'll, he'll strike at with a hand or, uh, uh, or with a weapon of some sort. He'll attempt to strike at. That's all it means. When he says he'll bruise your head, that word, this is what it means. Severe compression to the point of misshapenness. That's not a strike. That's a crushing. Matter of fact, some translations actually said he will crush your head. God is actually saying, there's going to come one say, you, you won here. You think you won this little battle here. You got Adam and Eve sin. But there's going to come one that will kill this thing. He's going to die. He's going to raise again. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is at work in us to liberate us, to free us, to release us from the grip of sin, and, and to reverse the shame uh, that the sins of others have brought on us. He brings freedom. I can't think of a better day. I was, set, I was looking at this first point, and I thought, well, this is the perfect day to preach this. Because the Bible says, no, there is no greater love than, than one lay down their life for their friends. We celebrate today, we celebrate, I don't even want to use that word really, we memorialize those who have laid down their lives for our freedom, who have given their lives. Um, let me, just a helpful hint, don't go up to a veteran today and wish him happy Memorial Day. It's not really what it's about. There's nothing happy about it, really. Well, you know, thank them for their service, but Veterans Day is in the future. That's when we'll have Ernie to stand a resident veteran. But Memorial Day is about honoring those. It's a better word than celebrate. It's about honoring those who laid down their life for us. Jesus is the ultimate example of that. The freedom that we have from sin. And can I tell you, you have freedom from sin. You do not have to be bound. You do not have to be caught up in, in habits and things that wear you down and bring death into your life because he has brought you freedom. He paid for that. He killed the snake on the cross. That same spirit gives us freedom from sin. It also gives us this. It gives us a change in perspective. Look at what Paul says in verse 5 of that chapter. 
those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. With that whole idea when he's using that phrase, control your mind, it, 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 the, the better way to say it in contemporary language is to ch change your perspective or change your mindset. He's talking about your mindset, how you view things. It's a subtle way of understanding or thinking about things. It's, it's your worldview, your perspective. Your worldview is your set of beliefs, a set of values that creates a, a framework or a structure by which you understand the world. It, it, it asks those questions who, who are we? Why are we here? Why, where do we come from? Where are we going? Is there a greater purpose? Is there an afterlife? But then your worldview also drives you to, to believe about moral issues and ethical issues and political issues. That's your mindset. It's how you view things. Your worldview gives you explanations for things in the world like good and evil. Your worldview also gives you a perspective on things that are a little bit closer to your personal life. How are your answering these things or, or why things are happening to you or what their purpose is to you. Hey, let me give you an example biblically. Um, it's, can I use a biblical example? It's, I, I find it's good when you're preaching to use biblical examples. Somebody told me that one time. In Philippians chapter 1, we see Paul in prison and, and he's there for, for a number of reasons that he could give. He could, he could say, well, you know, why Paul, why are you in jail? Why are you in prison? Um, he, he could say, he could have said, well, apparently God let me down. You know, um, he, he, that could have been his explanation. He could think, you know, maybe, maybe I did something wrong. I, I didn't live honorably enough for God. I, I somehow messed up. God's got me in prison. Maybe, maybe I made a mistake. He could sit and try to replay everything that, that he's done to try to figure out how he could have avoided his circumstances in that case. He could have blamed it on the enemy. My kids, when they were little, used to say, because they heard Andy say it so many different times, that's an attack of the enemy. And a lot of times it is. He could have said that. He, said, he could have said, this is the attack of the enemy trying to keep me from preaching the gospel. We need to have the church pray to free me immediately. Do these things sound familiar? Or just to me, because I've done all of those things. Why, God? What is going on? What did I do wrong? I mean, I've been in that place. He could have done all that. He could have blamed it on the injustices of that horrible Roman Empire that was, that was ruining his life. I've done that a lot lately. This is when I travel to other states where somehow COVID knows there's a state line and suddenly it's like there is none. Um, there's a lot of different reasons or explanations or understandings of the Lord that Paul could have used Listen to what he says in verse 12. This is his explanation. He says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, he's writing to the church in Philippi, but he's in jail, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. His explanation for what is happening to him is that this is happening to me because so it can be a catalyst to help spread the good news. That's the thing he leans into. Listen to what he says in verse 13. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's almost as if he says, I believe that all things are working together for my good. And he wrote that in another place. Because I'm called, and I'm called, and it's according to his purposes. That's how he explained the circumstance he was in. There, there, are, there are two ways we can live. One, we can allow God's thinking to impact our thinking. I think this is what Paul did here. Or, we can try to overlay our thinking on God's thinking and hold him in judgment for the things we believe he has done. That's what I tend to do. I'm, I'm trying to get back to number one more often. To be like the Apostle Paul. We can either let what we believe to be true about our circumstances dictate to us what must be true about God. Or we can let what we know to be true about God tell us what must be true about our circumstances. 
Why do you think Paul said, tearing down strongholds, grabbing, and he says, every thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, he says, to take it into captivity. That was his perspective. So when you have those thoughts and you're thinking, oh, why is this? Let the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead give you a change of perspective and use and think about how God did it. Or I might say, as Paul said in, in later on in Romans in 12, verse 2, don't conform to the patterns of things of this world, but allow God to transform you by getting rid of all your problems. Wait, that's not right. He says, let him transform you by changing the way you think. He doesn't say, let God just eliminate all the bad things. He says, let him change the way you think about your circumstances. We want out of the circumstances. We want the circumstances to go away. God just wants us to change how we look at them and see them through his eyes and think with his thinking. Paul was doing that. The mind, he says, that is led by the spirit and allows the thinking of God to affect our thinking. And it leads to what? Life and peace. See, he says, everything that's happened to me has served to advance the gospel. And that mindset allows Paul to live in life and peace because he's allowing God's thinking to affect his thinking. He's allowing himself to be transformed by the renewing of his mind. The life-giving spirit changes the way we view our world. It changes the way we view our circumstances. It changes the way we view the people around us. And it leads to life and peace. Some of you are struggling in crisis and turmoil and anxiety. You're in the same circumstances we all are. The circumstances probably aren't going to change. Maybe we can pray. We, we've been praying against the circumstances. That's okay. But if you want life and peace, it does not require the elimination of the circumstances. It requires you to have the mind of God. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and can change your entire worldview. He's given you freedom from sin. He's given you a change of perspective. Here's the third thing. He's given us our rightful identity. In verse 15 of that same chapter, he says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. That same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, adopts you into God's family. You were adopted. There's a seat at the table with your name on it. See, Father was actually Jesus' favorite title for God. He used the word Father 165 times in the Gospels. He refers to, to God his Father in the Lord's Prayer when he's teaching the disciples how to pray. He says, pray this way, our Father. He refers to God, his father, uh, when he is in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane on his way to the cross. He cries out and says, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, let your will be done. See, the spirit of God gives us intimacy with the father. Uh, and I know this is hard for some, for a lot of people. Um, I, I, I thought I was going to get a point uh, and I meant to pray earlier, pray for my, my mom and dad. My mom, I, I'm not, my mom sends me messages. I'm not sure who's the one that's sick. She doesn't really make that clear. Somebody's not feeling good today. They were packed up and getting ready to head this way. And just all of a sudden, so weren't feeling well and had to step. And they, they wanted to be here. I thought he was going to be here because I was really going to really sell this point. So my father, who's probably going to watch this today, maybe now, maybe later. Maybe he'll just listen to my mom tell him about it. I don't know. This thing is complicated for us because not everybody has a father like I had, a great father, an awesome father. And, and, and they, he, he reflected the love and joy and peace of my heavenly father. He was a great picture and type for me. But not everybody has that. So this is tough sometimes when we talk about this idea of being adopted and having a father because some of us have different, difficult relationships with your dad. You didn't have that kind of relationship. Or, or maybe your father was just absent altogether. It could be, if you're a lady, that you 
you've been so disrespected and mistreated by men in general that the idea of referring to God your Father is just off-putting to you. It's hard for you. But can I encourage you today that no matter what your earthly circumstances have been, you have a heavenly Father that goes well and beyond anything you've ever experienced on this earth. There's a story this has been written about a lot about when, when President John Kennedy became president. He was the first president in a, in a long time that suddenly had young children. And for the first time in a long time, there were young children running through the halls of the White House. Very different scenario than, than anybody who had worked there had been accustomed to. And, and, it's, and it's reported that, that, that John Jr., John F. Kennedy Jr., would often run into the Oval Office in his pajamas and slippers and jump right up into his dad's lap. And in that moment, it didn't matter what conversation, what decision, whatever legislation that he was looking at, no matter what cabinet conversation, no matter what officials or generals or secretaries or undersecretaries or whoever was in that moment, John Sr. would immediately turn his attention to John Jr. And it's like nothing else mattered. Now, for anybody else in that room, no matter how high cabinet position no matter how close to the president they were, no matter how trusted an advisor they were, for them to have jumped up in the president's lap would have been a little inappropriate. I mean, I don't think that would have worked. John Jr. knew who he was. He knew who his dad was. It didn't matter how many stars he had on his lapel, he could run right past him and jump in daddy's lap. And I tell you, that's the intimacy with the Father that the Spirit gives us. That loving, open, peaceful, joyful arms that are accepting and waiting for us. The Spirit wants to lead us into that. To have intimacy, yes, but to understand our identity and to understand that He is our Father. That's what the Spirit does. When you're adopted into the family of God, you receive intimacy with the Father. It changes your identity. And it takes away anything else that, that you might think about God. He says, listen, God is a lot of things and we are to honor and revere and there's being all of, all of those things, but ultimately he is your father. And the point is not that we somehow have some super spiritual relationship. I, I, I kind of struggle sometimes when people kind of break down the, the reverent side of God and uh, and listen, if you call him daddy, okay, I'm not judging you. But that's not really what Abba Father means. It means a closeness. It, it, it means that close intimacy. But I think we can be close and intimate and understand who we are in our identity without destroying the reference of who he is in the same time. It still works. God is waiting for you. He is both a reverent God, and I have I have these discussions with with other a lot of times other colleagues, other ministers, and and depending on where they are on the spectrum of things, I have friends that are super reverent, and and God is Father. You know, they say with that deep voice, He's Father. And then I got friends way on this side that He's like He's my daddy. You know, he's like, and we kind of have these discussions as to which. I'm not saying one's right, it's not about right or wrong, but I think God works in this wonderful balance where I think there are moments when his presence is heavy, when we realize the creator of the universe has stooped low just to simply wrap his arms around us, that we just kind of fall on our faces in reverence and we're not worthy and we feel that way about him. And at the same time, there are moments in your life when he wraps his arms around you and he's daddy. I'm not sure either one is wrong. I think we just need to make sure on this end that we don't, we're not irreverent to him. And on this end, that we understand that even though he's the creator of the universe, he's still our father. I think it's both and and everything in between. And I really think it depends on the moment, to be honest with you. There are, there are holy moments that I think deserve and are, deserve our reverence. And then there are super intimate times when, when it's you and God alone that it's totally appropriate for him to be daddy. 
I, I kind of think it's kind of like that, that when we talk about intimacy, there is a corporate level of who he is, and then there's a personal level with who he is. And I know some people want to just make it all the same. We're supposed to be intimate with him, even in a corporate, you know, we just, it, it, there's no difference. Well, there is a difference. I mean, I, I have been instructed since the time I did premarital counseling that I am to be intimate with my wife. That's my responsibility as a husband. But they frown on that a little bit at the Golden Crown. Um, you know, it's, there's a time and a place. There's a, there's a place, and, and I think we've got to find those moments where we understand. Now, can I tell you, it's okay if you're here and you need God, you need Daddy in that moment. It's okay if you're right here amongst everybody else. That, that's why we have a freedom here, okay? But understand that it's not, uh, it's not one or the other. It's both and. He's all of that together. That's why I love this picture of Kennedy and John Jr. is because it's very reverent, it's very moment, but in that moment, he's daddy and he's, you know, it's the same. Listen, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And he wants you to have freedom from your sin. He wants you to have a new worldview, a new perspective. He wants you to have God's thinking in your life. And he wants you to have intimacy with the Father. He wants you to understand who you are and who your identity is. See, the point is not whether he's father or daddy. The point is that you are his child. And that's who you are. It's really not who he is that's as important as whose you are. And do you belong to him? I, I, I couldn't think of a more appropriate way today when, when, uh, when, when we were closing the time with music worship today. That's what we were singing. It requires us to abandon our hearts, to surrender all, and to have all that we are to be his. Because it totally acknowledges who we are in him. When we surrender to him, when we identify as who we are as a child of God, it's a place of surrender. Not, Paul says, not because you are slaves any longer, but because you are adopted, you are children of God. That's what that same spirit does. I just want to close with this. This, this, is, this is number four. This is Appendix 1A. This is extra. Something that same spirit also brings to us. You know, um, a magnet is just something that's been, I don't understand the physics of it, but it's something that's been magnetized. Well, that's really good, and that's neat. <laughs> something happened, they do something to it, it has something to do with electrons or protons or something, and, and, it, and it does, but what it does, it causes things to attract to it, but not everything. You can take a magnet and run it across a bunch of things, but it has to, the only the way it can attract is to have things that have the same substance in it that's in the magnet. Whether, that, whether it's probably like ore or something that metal or something or other. You can even take things that look metal, but if they don't have that substance in it, the magnet will not lift them up, will not pull them up as you brought across. Can I tell you one more thing? That same spirit is, that same spirit's going to return one day. Now that same spirit is here in us, but Jesus will return. And when he does, those that have the same substance, like a magnet, the Bible says we'll be caught away to meet him in the air. And that's a very real thing. And I don't know if it's going to look like a magnet or not, but I, the image I have is Jesus coming back and the same spirit that raised him from the dead that's in you. Anybody who has that same spirit in them, just like a magnet, will be drawn to him in that moment. That's a promise that we have. So I, I encourage you today you need that same spirit in you. You need the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And that same spirit comes and resides in you as you accept him, as you follow him. But he wants you not just to be resided. He wants you to be like those 120 on the day of Pentecost and be completely immersed and baptized and endued with power and overflowing with that same spirit. Or, or, or as the New Testament then refers to later on, full of the Holy Spirit. Not just filled, not just not just even baptized, but full, constantly over and over again, seeking the endowment and power of the Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. 
needs to live and dwell and overflow in you. Will you pray with me? Father, you are so good to us. Lord, we thank you that you promised us over and over again that you would leave the Holy Spirit with us. That you would give us the Holy Spirit. You made that promise and fulfilled that promise in Acts chapter 2 and have continued to do so. As the, your ecclesia, your church was created and birthed in that moment, you continue to let people experience that fullness of the Holy Spirit. And even today, God, we know we can experience that today. God, I just pray for those today that need to make that, maybe that first step to follow you, to admit that they're a sinner. Without you, they can't do anything. They need to change direction and follow after you, to acknowledge that you came, you died, you rose again, to ask you to be the Lord, the supreme authority, the owner of their life, and allow your Holy Spirit to dwell in them those of us that have made that confession of faith, God, I just pray today that if there's any that haven't been completely and fully immersed and baptized in your Holy Spirit, that they would pray that today. God, I pray that any person that has that desire today, that you would fill them, baptize them, overflow their life with the power of the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Continue to do that for us. Continue to put that dwelling in us. God, I pray that you will create a thirst in us like we have never had before to be full of your Holy Spirit, to be continually asking and seeking the empowerment and enduing the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we would stay full of you, that same Spirit that raised you from the dead. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit for being in us and with us today. Can you say amen? Amen. I kept thinking as our pastor was sharing um, a group that I have come to love is one of my favorite worship groups is uh, called People in Songs. And they have a song that one section of it, uh, they just sing over and over again this line. I am, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. You are who you are because of Christ and what he did for you and what the Father says about you and what the Spirit implants in your heart. He is the one who defines you, not the world, not your circumstances, not your situations in life, but he defines you. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to the message today. We encourage, if you would, to fill out your connection card. On the back of that is a scripture you can memorize this week, and there are some action steps you can take. And so if you would, check those off and then turn the card in before you leave today. You can always respond with your tithes and your offering, honoring the Lord with a portion of that that he's blessed you with. And then you respond as we're going to do in just a moment and go to communion. Uh, this weekend, of course, is when we celebrate Memorial Day, but in the traditional church calendar, today also is Trinity Sunday. Uh, Trinity Sunday is always the Sunday after Pentecost Sunday. And I was thinking about that this morning and it's appropriate for this message on the Spirit, the same Spirit. Uh, because when you study Scripture, one of the things that sometimes you, you might not catch right off, but if you carefully study the New Testament, you will see that all three members of the Godhead were involved in salvation. Father, Son, and Spirit, all three were very active in the work of Christ and what he did for us on the cross and the resurrection and in bringing us to salvation. For God, the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, the Son, should not have perished, have everlasting life. And yet Jesus said, no man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. All three members of the Godhead, and as we saw in the scripture we read at the beginning, the, 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 the Father and the Spirit were both involved in the resurrection of Christ. But Jesus himself said, you destroyed this temple. In three days, I will raise it up. 
And you go through scripture after scripture. So as we think about that same spirit today, remember, he also was involved in salvation that would happen to us. So when we take communion, this is the thought I want you to think about for communion. God himself, in all his fullness, Father, Son, and Spirit, loves you so much, so completely, so absolutely, that all that God is became involved in Jesus going to the cross to die for you. The fullness of the Godhead, of the Trinity, was involved in Jesus going to the cross to pay for our sins, to die for us. That's how much God loves every one of us. He gave himself completely for our salvation. You just take a moment and, as Scripture said, examine yourselves, prepare your hearts to receive communion today. Father, we do just that. We take just a moment now and in quietness we look inward and prepare our hearts to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Give us for our sins, Father, to change our very perspective on life and to name us as your children, to adopt us as sons and daughters of God, to do the work of salvation and redemption in us. Thank you, Father. Father, that same Spirit now goes with us and empowers us to go out into this world that is lost and dying without hope, without Jesus but to go out as light and as salt to let the world know there is a Savior. May that same Spirit go with us this day, this week, and empower us, Father, and equip us, energizing us to do the work of God. May that same Spirit, Father, continue to stir our hearts for revival. God, we want to move of your Spirit in this church. We pray for a move of your Spirit in this community. We pray for a move of the Spirit in our country, Father. This nation, this people, we need you, Father. Forgive us for our sins. Lord, have mercy on us, God. And God, help us, I pray. Thank you, Father. Father, let us go forth in power with that same Spirit today to serve you faithfully. And to that end, we pray our benediction, Father. Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.